Why would they leave the place such a mess? I don't know. You think they'd at least bury the body? Possibly. Anyway. Howdy, partner. This video was originally going to be a Halloween video last year, but due to real life nonsense, I missed the date by quite a bit, and it was deprioritized because I deemed it not funny enough, which is a bullshit metric to have. That kind of thinking will only damage me in the long run. So in an effort to combat that idea, I present this video. Also, I kind of want to cover Shadow Hearts this year, and I really want to talk about it anyway. Enjoy. I think that when most people see horror on the box of a game, they expect something along the lines of... There's a pattern. Isn't about escape, Jacob. Not anymore! Keep shooting until they're dead or we run out of ammo. But horror is not this binary setting that gets turned on during development. There's a spectrum of things people are afraid of. Fear of loss, death, isolation, existential dread, your own body. Since horror encompasses so many ideas, I think it's worth exploring it in as many ways as we can, in every genre it will fit. But JRPGs? The games where we kill God using the power of friendship? Games where we kill inconsequential enemies to make the number go big? With the anime pretty boys and the well-endowed ladies? You'd be surprised about how potent a spice horror is. Something that Hiroki Kakuda wanted to experiment with. A man known for composing the soundtrack for Secrets of Mana and Trails of Mana. Two games known for having some incredible music, with the latter having some of my favorite tracks from the SNES. He poured his soul into those games. But after Trails did poorly in sales, he desired a lot more control over any project he was involved in. So, Kakuda wanted to lead development for a new game, but Square at this time was awful for horizontal movement in the company. Once a composer, always a composer. Fantastic if you were content with staying a composer, otherwise I assume it was suffocating. He left Square to found Sacknoth to work on his horror JRPG, which would be named Kudelka. The game takes place in 1898 at a remote mansion called Nemington in Wales. A second named Kuldelka arrives here after being called to by a spirit. Oh, by the way, the game's called Kuldelka, and the main character's Kuldelka, just so you know. Inside, she meets up with the unscrupulous Edward. My name is Kuldelka, and I'm only going to say this once, so don't forget. If you want to get out of here alive, I suggest you stick very close. Got it? Charmed, I'm sure. Teaming up, they discover the caretakers of this place, who promptly try to murder them. Speaking of which, you wasted all of that food. What's wrong with you? Yeah, if it weren't poison, then I would have had some. Pardon? They also find a priest named James, who also seems to have been poisoned. Together, all three start exploring this mansion to figure out why this place is infested with monsters. Who called out to Kuldelka, and what is up with the caretakers? Surprisingly, Kuldelka is limited to just this mansion. Something that is very uncommon to this genre. Most JRPGs are not content unless they have worlds, emphasis on the plural. Instead, we have something more akin to Resident Evil's level's design. One intricate location that winds in and out of itself. This also has the advantage of rooms being designed to be memorable, since that's kind of vital for navigation. But don't worry, not only do you get a really good map, but the game labels important rooms when you enter them. There's no chance of you getting lost here. That also means the puzzle rooms stick out like a sore thumb. Just like those survival horror games, we have inventory puzzles that are basically lock and key affairs, since the game prompts you if you have the item. Something like... You see a shelf with an indentation. Would you like to place a copy of Black Lagoon on DVD here? And of course, you also have the who designed this place puzzles. You know the kind. The ones where you enter a room and the floor is covered in symbols. Kudelka is really kind in terms of puzzles. To solve this floor symbol room, for example, you have to find two sets of markings around the mansion. Each one will give you a clue. Once you've found them, attempting the floor puzzle again will have the game pause and remind you what the symbols were. Twice. This is a game that wants you to succeed no matter the cost. We'll talk about how conducive that is with the idea of horror later. I should also mention there's nothing I would consider a jump scare in this game. This is a much more of a vibe out kind of spooky mood. That's also easy to do while soaking up all the backgrounds. Everything is rendered in lovely detail. Lots of natural blue lighting wherever they can fit it in. 
but keeps a bit of the grunge thanks to the compression needed to fit it on the disc. You do have this awkward pause between each of the camera angles, but since the game has zero threats while exploring, it really adds to the mood, completed by a lack of music. The only things you'll be hearing is your character's footsteps on harsh stone or creaky wood, crackling fires, howling winds and rustling chains, and sometimes something you can't quite identify. Despite the complete lack of danger in the overworld, it got to me quite a few times. Cutscenes are scored accordingly, but the only time the music really kicks up is in the battles. We don't have a lot of tracks, but what we do pulls some weight. When you imagine a horror soundtrack, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Perhaps something tense? Or perhaps you thought of some more distorted instruments to reinforce the horror. All that in mind, Kuldelka instead goes with this. It's calming. It comes right out of left field, but it's beautiful. It's a track that reminds you that this might not be the first time Kildelka has dealt with things like this. She is practiced and collected in the face of such horrors. Unless the fight starts going south. Now this is a really long track, and if the battle starts taking longer than three minutes, not a common occurrence, mind you. The track transitions into the suspenseful piano sting before being overwhelmed by a distorted organ note like tangible dread seeping in. Then the panic takes hold. breathe. Everything fades out apart from the drums so you can catch your breath, at which point the song loops. It's fantastic, it might be one of the best battle themes I've heard. And I gotta move on otherwise I'll be stuck on the boss theme next. The game only has four battle tracks in total, but they're all really great. Gotta give props to Kakuda. At any point during your exploration the screen will wash away and serve you a battle, or you wander into a boss fight. No kind of horror sting or anything, thankfully, it just goes right into the fray. Combat takes place on a 6x5 grid. The grid itself is probably the thing with the most depth. On a character's turn, you can move three spaces in any direction. But, you cannot move past an enemy. Imagine them drawing a line across the battlefield that limits movement. Thankfully, this goes both ways, incentivizing you to create a front line. Depending on your builds, but generally keeping squishy party members away from melee is a winning strategy. I think Sun Tzu said that one. One boss fight plays with this idea by literally having cover based shooting. I have no knowledge on optimal build paths since I went in completely blind. However, my strategy seemed to work, so I'll share it here. Kuldalga was my magic attacker, James took the role of the party buffer slash ranged expert, and Edward became the pugilist tank. Every character has their own star and stats, but seeing how I ended the game at level 60-ish, that would have been around 240 stat points I spent per party member, so the cast is definitely malleable. 
You might be wondering, why did Edward not have a weapon? Two reasons. As you use magical weapons, your character will level up with that type of thing, allowing it to do more damage or allow multiple hits in a single attack, essentially promoting specialization. Thing is, weapons can break on use, causing you to lose that weapon permanently. Secondly, the overworld only has a certain amount of weapons to find. The rest drop from enemies, which in turn can theoretically cause a weapon drought. So Edward decided to punch the horrors in the face instead. Having decent damage no matter the situation felt like a huge plus. Word of warning, don't use light weapons. Just, just, just don't. Anyone who's tried playing this game, I have to ask you a question. Did you stop playing because of this boss? After James joins the party, this group of things await you as the second boss, and it completely destroyed me. This is a super nasty scenario. The green and blue ones pepper you with spells while buffing the red one and creating a front line. Uh, hold up. Minor epilepsy warning for those who are sensitive. Skip forward here. Cool? Cool. The red enemy runs to a corner and becomes a ticking time bomb until it does a battle-wide spell that will annihilate anyone unprepared. Which, safe to assume, that would be most people. It was the only time I felt obligated to do a bit of grinding. Weird thing is that there was some challenge after this boss fight, but about halfway through disc 2 the difficulty crashed through the floor, never to be seen again until an optional fight much later on. Kudalka also has one of the lowest encounter rates I've ever seen. At one point I think I hit more than 3 minutes between fights, maybe more. Despite this, I was never underleveled. Any boss I beat usually gave me 2 levels and a pat on the back. It was very strange, I never felt in control, but my levels and strength never lagged behind them. Props to the devs for seemingly creating a level curve this effective, I guess. So the fights are easy. Maybe you won't feel that way when you actually see what you're fighting. Zombies and crows? I can deal with that. Creepy marionette? Spooky and reminds me of DMC, but you know, still fine, good for the setting. Uh, uh, oh, oh god, what is that baby attached to? Is... is that what's left of the baby's body with a new head? I don't know what this is, but it's better than the walking torso with a mouth inside that throws guts. Oh, what the fuck is that? So many eyes. Kudelga has some downright inspired enemy design. It's a coin flip if what I'm looking at is normal quotation marks, or something that makes me want to throw up. That's not to say that the non-disgusting monsters don't look good. We are super late into the PS1 generation, which means some really good looking detailed models. The age of the system gives it an uncanny edge to how it looks, especially with that trademark PS1 warped textures. While we don't have any loud horror, there is definitely some things to chew on. I, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to look at this anymore. In the past, before someone took ownership of this mansion, it was the ruins of a monastery filled with pain and death. Somewhere to dispose of political rivals and those who talk too much. Using the red stained glass in a certain place can help you find an old god's diary that details the bloody events of the past. How they tortured people for no real gain, just to inflict as much pain as humanly possible before death spared them. It's thanks to this diary I learned where a spider is. Okay, do not look that up. Just know that humans can be exceptionally cruel, and we made things tailor-made for your gender. Alright? Alright. If you did look it up, you can now blame me in the comments. This all gives the monastery a malevolent atmosphere that you just cannot shake. A mood enhanced by some quality voice acting. No room for this argument nowadays. James. Hermeticism, you... Kabbalah, meaningless. Why, why is it not here? What? Where else can it be? Are you looking for something? I don't understand. I don't understand. You don't understand. I don't understand. What are you grumbling about? I was actually shocked by the performances in Kudelka. Compared to other games of this generation, it is actually outstanding. rotten piece of with this disc i shall become ruler of the entire world <laughs> i'm sorry i don't mean to keep clowning on hard edge or trag depending on where you brought up i actually really like that game but just you know 
peaks and valleys. Kudelka is professional and takes the danger seriously, being the only person who somewhat understands the situation. What a discovery! Do you remember what this place is? It's not just a monastery, it was a prison. People were executed for fighting each other for supremacy. These treasures must have been taken from them, soaked with curses and hatred. Though that does not mean she's uptight. Find a place to regroup, clear? Got it. Kudelka. Yeah? Don't get killed. <laughs> Same to you. Edward seems emotional and Good brash. Is... That doesn't sound like a demonic spirit to me. The noise is coming from that building over there. The poison didn't kill us, so now they're taking the fast and easy way now. Don't be ridiculous! Why don't you ask the bullets who's being ridiculous? You idiots! But he's certainly not stupid. Thieves can be exceedingly honest, you know? Still... He did try to kill us. For that... <laughs> what did you do that for? And James is dismissive, his high station in the church causing him to be detached and cruel. Who on earth are you two? Hey! We rescued you and that's your way of saying thanks? Little did I know that these these days were into rescuing perfect strangers. Ew. There's also a lot of things to add to the presentation of the voice acting. For one, the cutscenes are motion captured, lending much more physicality to the performances, thanks to them also being the voice actors for the characters too. There's no awkward middleman to make it seem like the elements are disconnected. <sighs> hey! Hello there. What is your name? Oh, what's this Final Fantasy X footage doing here? Huh, weird. Add into that would be the pre rendered backgrounds. Since the models are just being layered onto a picture, you can't really do anything dynamic with it. You could have multiple backgrounds to switch to, each one with a noticeable load and freeze that would hamper the pace of any cutscene. Or lean into the flat static shot to create a stage play effect. Now, I can't speak for the developers here. My interpretation that this was a stylistic choice? The way every cutscene starts with a fade in, actors standing on their starting positions waiting for action to be yelled off screen. The framing of the camera gives this feeling that this is a stage, and we are watching a performance. For all I know, this is intentional, and I hope it was. Regardless of intention, it does help the mood. So unlike most of the games I reviewed, the story is kind of vital to everything that's happened. Here's the time code for those who want to avoid spoilers. You still here? Alright, strap in. We're going from the very beginning, folks. 1878. Returning from a routine ferry trip, the SS Princess Alice collided with another boat on the Thames River. The resulting crash led to the loss of around 600 people, inspired by the real-life event, no less. The blame was put onto Captain Odgen, despite his claims there was nothing he could have done. The only person to believe him was a woman named Elaine. Daughter of a family of high society, she had the interest of two men who were studying chemistry, Patrick and James. Though due to James's lower standing, he felt incapable of caring for Elaine and asked his friend Patrick to take good care of her. To hide from his pain, he abandoned his love and joined the church. Years go by. During one of Patrick's travels, a robber broke into the house, and unfortunately, Elaine was murdered. Grief-stricken, Patrick turns to alchemy in order to find a way that can bring Elaine back to life. He discovered something called the Emigre document. It details Celtic rituals that can resurrect the dead. He pays a lot of money to have it stolen from the Vatican, and purchased a place that is both out of the way and filled with the dark history. Odgen and his wife, feeling indebted to the kindness that Elaine showed them, helped Patrick in his questionable endeavors. Using the power of a cauldron, a golden container that will be the vessel for alchemy, Patrick starts experimenting to figure out how to bring Elaine back. First he was reasonable, he tried livestock, then starts abducting prostitutes, until things get so out of hand he starts batch ordering slaves off the black market. All this commotion attracts thieves looking for an easy mark. They don't get much further past the kind old caretakers. Odgen seeing them like the burglar that killed Elaine, murdering them out of a sense of vengeance for her death. That explains why Edward ended up here. James, on the other hand, was ordered by the Vatican to retrieve the emigre document. Kuldelka and the group arrive at the mansion after Patrick successfully performed the ritual. But if that's the case, who called Kuldelka here? 
inside the mansion, they also meet Roger Bacon, also a real-life historical figure. A centuries-old warlock that gives legitimacy to the emigre document, as he was the original transcriber, in the process using the knowledge contained to give himself eternal life, with the unfortunate downside of continuing to age. The group eventually finds a place to channel Elaine's spirit. She informs them that Patrick managed to revive her body, but without the spirit, it is nothing but a horrific monster and asks them to destroy it so her spirit can return to the afterlife. Inside the halls of the church, they find Patrick's corpse, as well as a very large plant. Climbing to the top of the chapel is where the endings start diverging. If you forgot to collect Kuldelka's pendant, the very same one she lost in the intro, moving towards the flower bud will result in your death. I'm not a fan of fuck you endings like this unless it's heavily signposted, but at least the game has some decency to throw up some text warning that this will end badly. That and there is no proper save room between here and the point of no return, so you're less likely to walk right into it causing a soft lock. And even then, should you manage that, a random bell here has a chance to drop the pendant, which will stop the false ending. I applaud the devs for that level of foresight. You really see that, especially this early on, goddamn. Having the pendant means you fend off the attack and get chased to the top of the church where the final battle takes place. Overcoming the odds and winning this fight gives you the good end in quotation marks, which is so memorable, I forgot everything that happens in it. Somebody told me that after a loved one's death, all we have is memories. In these, we maintain an eternal bond with the dead. The much more interesting bad ending requires you to lose the final boss fight. Dear God, is this my fault? Do you blame me? Are you punishing me now because the path to my faith was tainted? I accept my fate. If it is your wish, then I accept my fate. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with the sword he will be killed. I am what I am. I am content with my lot. I have always loved you, Elaine. James joins Elaine in heaven. Kuldelka and Edward spend the night together, then eventually part ways. Not only is this ending the confirmed canon that the Shadow Art series continue from, it's just more emotionally cathartic for James, seeing that he gave up so much in his life. Also might have the unintended, or intended, reaction of James' general attitude towards the other two members. The things he says about the heretic orphans dying is correct? Sin. To seek help from someone you've never met before is ridiculous, especially when people are dying from hunger every single day in London. Oh, they're all filthy anymore, little beggars that deserve to die. God saw this true believer and granted his prayer. Cruel and unforgiven for those who do not have time for him. It would go along with one of the themes of the games, of an uncaring world made bearable by a few good people. Kuldelka is short for a JRPG, which means it's about normal length for most people. My playthrough clocked in around about 12 hours, and good lord was that length a lovely change compared to the 40-50 hour nightmare of other games in this genre. I love JRPGs to bits, don't get me wrong, but I do not have time for them sometimes unless it's the only thing I'm doing. The blending of horror into the JRPG formula was a bit more common around this time. Not to mention the inherent tension that this genre can bring, of being low on resources in a dangerous place, uncertain of where the next save point is. Kuldelka is much more content using the mood, visuals and audio to carry the horror of the game, as it's rather easy once you get over the second boss hump. The battle designer lamented making the game as easy as it is, 
The original idea was to make it accessible to people who don't play many horror games. But in retrospect, some of the devs wished that they could have bumped up the difficulty. I think the original difficulty was the right choice for Kodelka. Dying to a zombie in a survival horror game can take less than a minute. Of course, there's frustration in losing progress to a hazard like that, but maybe you can change how you approach it next time. Maybe spend some more resources, maybe pick a different route. JRPGs, however, are a menu-driven genre. That means that everything takes longer. The same time of death in JRPGs could have taken dozens of minutes as you try to claw back victory, only to lose it to an unforeseen attack. That frustration can boil over into something worse very quickly. Or you remove the tension by simply grinding the problem away. I think for all that Kudelka is, I see the potential for something truly amazing, but I don't think it's perfect. Just a really good game and a really interesting experience for anyone that can get into it. Oh, the horror of being a good game, ah. Uh... It's also the spiritual prequel to the Shadowheart series, with it continuing off of ending 2. So if that interests you, this might be a lovely gateway into Shadow Hearts. But of course, trying to get the game once again is its own challenge, as most cult classics on PS1 are like. So I'm just going to say it straight. Same with The Lunger 1 and 2. Until it shows up somewhere on digital shelves, I consider it free. I can't tell you where to look, but it shouldn't be that difficult. Especially if you add some Vim to your search. That's Vim with two M's, by the way. Hello, and welcome to the end of the video, where this time I have a script for once. I know, I'm learning. Uh, I only have one or two things this time. Since Kuldelka has nothing but battle tracks and cutscene music designed for certain moments, I decided to build an OST for the video out of a bunch of games. Going forwards, I'll either put up what I use at the end, or in the description, in order of use. Maybe both. I'm starting to build up quite the library, and some games just don't have a versatile soundtrack, so expect to hear some adjacent sound in music. The Symphony of the Night video, for example, has a bunch of Lema of Innocence tracks, just to bulk it out. I'll still talk about a game's OST if it's worth mentioning, which I most likely will, since I personally value video game music a lot. This should also mitigate any more, let's say, hard to listen to soundtracks? I can and have had the Drakengard OST playing in the background while I work on stuff. That's not everyone though. I don't think that's a normal thing. So having easier songs to listen to for a video is just a good idea. Oh, and I might kick up the Twitch channel again soon. Username is the same as it is on YouTube, as it is on Twitch. If you want to preemptively follow, or, you know, look for the link in the description. That's about it. Look forward to whatever I make next. And if you can find out where it is, can you tell me? Because I have no clue. Alright, make sure to subscribe. Peace.